into just any old protein and inject it into mice, and they will develop anti-mitochondrial antibodies, and they'll even develop inflammation in the liver that looks like PBC. So you can actually take this chemical, put it in mice, and induce PBC. So pretty strong evidence that at least one pathway to getting PBC would be through chemical exposure and breakdown of that tolerance. The nice thing about this is it then gives us a model to look for treatments in addition to understanding it. And then the other piece of this is why the bile ducts. Um, it's important to recognize that the, the anti-mitochondrial antibody, it reacts against mitochondria. Mitochondria are in essentially all cells of our body. So why in the world are only these bile ducts and the small bile ducts the, the cells in the small bile ducts, why are they only the target? Why doesn't this affect the bile ducts in large bile ducts or any other cells? Why doesn't it affect the liver cells or who knows where? And that has to do with the very specific function of the, the, the bile duct cells when they undergo a process called apoptosis. Cells normally undergo cell death and regeneration and there's a program um, a process of cell death called programmed cell death or apoptosis. And when that occurs, the proteins are supposed to be degraded. And it turns out then when, that when the bile duct cells undergo this process, the, the, the protein uh, that the anti-mitochondrial antibodies are reacting against does not get broken down. It remains intact and can stimulate an immune response. So there's something about these bile duct cells that allow them to be the target of this attack. And this is true of anybody's bile duct cells, so it's not unique to a PBC patient. And that's why PBC can recur when you get transplanted with the liver from somewhere else, someone else is because those bile duct cells still have the same um, uh, problem in terms of uh, uh, degrading the protein. So now that I've bored you with all the science or what happens, with, what's the difference between treatment of PBC and PSC? So this is a, a typical PBC patient, uh, someone I followed for a number of years, presented with an alkaline phosphatase of 350, put her on Urso, came down to under 100, and many years later, she's remained there and is doing fine. Um, of course, we know not everybody responds that way. Um, about 40% don't. Uh, and what one of the nice things that we've learned in the last, you know, several years has been the ability to, de to identify individuals that are at greatest risk of progression of their disease. And actually, the Intercept little video before this kind of illustrated that. And this is study, this is, uh, these are results from the global PBC group that show that after treatment for a year with Urso, if your alkaline phosphatase is just over the normal limit, um, the risk of progression of your disease starts going up. And it continues to go up um, as the alkaline phosphatase goes up. In addition, even before the bilirubin gets beyond the upper limit of normal, this is one. So even if it's in the normal range, there's already an increase in the risk of developing a progression of the disease. But both these things, the alkaline phosphatase and the bilirubin, really correlate very strongly with whether someone's going to do well with Urso or not with Urso. So we have a very good feel for who needs additional therapy and who doesn't. In PSC, we don't have that. And, we, and Urso does not work in PSC, at least in the majority of patients. There have been several studies looking at Urso and PSC. And um, most of them started at the typical dose of 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per day, which most of you should, all you should be on. And as was mentioned earlier, at the high doses, you see some downsides, and you shouldn't use higher doses. And however, in, in PSC, we continued to do studies with increasing doses of Urso, and the last one used a dose that's essentially twice what we use in PVC. And while the alkaline phosphatase got better in the group that got Urso compared to the group that got placebo, the people that got the Urso actually did worse. So alkaline got better, people got worse. Um, and that was largely because their fibrosis got worse. They got more varices, they were listed for liver transplantation. So this is 
these are the individuals that got ERSO, and these are the individuals that got placebo. So um, this has made it really difficult for us in PSC to see, to correlate what a response is with any medication. The other thing you have in PBC is, of course, a beta-colic acid, and this is just data from the, the study looking at the different doses and what the response rates were. So about 45% responded to, to a beta-colic acid that hadn't completely responded to ERSO, um, and then the issues with pruritus. But the good news for both of these diseases is there's a lot of new therapies in the pipeline. Um, when I've given a talk to this group and other groups, you know, even six, seven years ago, and definitely 10 years ago, this would have been blank. There would have been nothing. Um, and now we've got obeticolic acid that was just approved um, for PBC patients with an inadequate response to ERSO. It's in clinical trials for PSC. There's another drug that works in a pathway very similar to obeticolic acid that's in clinical trials for PBC and just started one in PSC. This is a similar drug also to obeticolic acid in trials for PBC. Uh, I think you heard about the Stemabe um, drug earlier that's uh, in trials for PBC. They just stopped, but hopefully we'll see something else there. There's this, some, a related compound called NOR-ERSO um, being studied in Europe and PSC. And then there's a whole host of other drugs. These all sort of work on bile acids. Um, these work on preventing the reabsorption of bile acids from the intestines. And this one completed studies both in PBC and PSC. And this, this was actually for itch. Um, Glaxo's uh, looking at, uh, just completed a study in PBC um, with their drug. There's antifibrotic medications, the simtuzumab that's in uh, trials for PSC. I'm not aware of any plans for it in PBC. And then there's, you know, the, the interesting thing about PBC to me is that it's a classic autoimmune disease. And we've got drugs for rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and my, multiple sclerosis, everything else that's directed at the immune system, yet in PBC we've yet to really find a drug that targets the immune system that's effective. Um, so we have a study right now working with Abatacept. <clears throat> We're almost done with that study. Um, there's uh, a drug from this company called Tobira that I don't like to pronounce. It's CVC for short. <clears throat> and that's being studied in PSC. And then vedolizumab, which is a drug for um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, uh, is also being uh, studied in PSC, or hopefully soon will be. So I think the, the take-home message is that both PSC and PBC there are a lot of therapies out there being developed, and I think there's more to come over the next few years that's going to really help us in terms of treating both these conditions. So just to finish up, you know, primary biliary cholangitis, it's more than just a name. It's a distinct clinical entity that's different from PSC. Um, some features are shared um, and can lead to a misdiagnosis. Uh, and, but it's important to recognize that the natural history associated conditions are different and the treatment and management are different. So the diagnosis uh, differentiating these two is really quite important. Clearly, we need more education of doctors to avoid confusion, which frequently um, occurs. Uh, both education and awareness, I guess, is, is, uh, to be, needs to be done on both fronts. These are rare diseases. Um, they affect the same organ, the same structure, so it's understandable that your primary care physician is going to get them confused and, and, you know, maybe even lead to the diagnosis of primary biliary sclerosis. I think patient organizations such as PBCers are really a, the a great position to lead campaigns to um, educate gastroenterologists and particularly patients. I think, you know, it's very important for patients in rare diseases to be self-educated, understand what the issues are because they can't necessarily rely on their physician that doesn't see a lot of patients to, to make the right uh, decision or be knowledgeable. Um, and patients themselves should be sure of their diagnosis. So I think that's it. Thank you very much and happy to answer any questions.
that's I'll read them. Right, so the inflammatory bowel disease of PSC uh, is typically classified as ulcerative colitis, but clearly with Crohn's colitis, you can also have um, uh, PSC. So there, there is a link, and there's, there are some differences um, of the way PSC presents depending on whether you have ulcerative colitis or um, Crohn's colitis. So the answer, short answer, yes. Uh, PBC patients, not so much for gallstones that I'm aware of. PSC patients, yes. Um, bile duct disease, it's a bile duct disease, so yes. Uh, but bile duct cancer, no. Gallbladder cancer, no. And PBC, yes. And PSC. Was that the question? So I'm not a urologist. Um, I, I, I really can't comment on how to manage the urinary tract infections of PBC. It, to my knowledge, it wouldn't be any different than you would any other urinary tract infection or recurrent UTIs. The, the thought of the association between PBC and UTIs is not that the infections the, the, the recurrent infections are the cause or that PBC is causing the infections. It's the exposure to the bacteria. And the bacteria have um, the same protein uh, that could stimulate an immune response, which would lead to antimitochondrial antibodies and the immune response then directs to the liver. So it's really just having that exposure to the bacteria of a UTI. But in terms of the management of the UTIs, it really would just be the same. Um, and some people do need chronic antibiotics. I, there were some questions before the talk also about Tylenol and um, uh, ibuprofen, Advil. And I think that goes into a general question about medications and PBC and medications and, and liver disease in general. It's a, it's a frequent conversation that we have. In general, if your liver, if your early stage disease um, your liver should metabolize pretty much every drug normally. And you're not at any greater risk in general of having drug toxicity, drug-induced liver injury, we call it, or DILI, than someone without an underlying liver disease. So um, in terms of antibiotics, taking them or not, there's really no additional concern um, because you have PBC. Uh, I'm not aware of data on UTIs, and I'm not aware of data on probiotics and PBC either, so can't really comment. I will say that, you know, pr probiotics are not, you know, there are probiotics and then probiotics, you know, what you take, um, how much you can actually get into your system orally from a probiotic, it's, you know, quite variable, so um, just to say probiotic is, is difficult to, to really comment on also. So autoimmune diseases <clears throat> run in families, and we know that the, there are genetics that underlie a lot of that. So while I showed you the picture showing the genetics are different, there are genes that are shared across just about all, um, all autoimmune conditions. And so, so it's not surprising that someone with PBC, and particularly with all these other autoimmune conditions, would have other family members or children with an autoimmune condition. Uh, so it's not surprising they have ulcerative colitis. Now, if you look at ulcerative colitis patients in general, about 3 to 5 percent of them will develop PSC. And I don't think it would be any higher in an individual who's 
mom, <coughs> mom had PBC uh, than someone otherwise. So I would say there's a concern, yes, but it's still not common. It's only three to five percent. They should be getting liver tests. If they become abnormal, get an MRI to look at the cholangiogram, and that's about what I'd recommend for kind of imaging and screening. Um, so, the, just having dilated ducts, um, that can occur from many different causes. Um, it can happen from benign causes, like a, a stone that gets uh, stuck. Anything that obstructs the flow of bile will cause dilated ducts. It could be, you know, sludge, other, other things. So I really can't comment um, for, beyond that. Um, the weight gain associated with, with Urso, um, I don't know that we really understand the mechanism of it um, or the significance of it really either. Um, and, and I would just advise the usual things in terms of weight loss management. I mean, it's, it's, there is no easy solution, um, right? I mean, if there was, be rich if I had that answer. Um, actually, a faculty member, young faculty member wanted to do a, a study. He, he was sure he could cure fatty liver disease. All they have to do is diet and exercise. <laughs> Easy, right? Works for everybody. <laughs> All right. Can That's a really good question. Um, can obaticolic acid be used in patients with slightly elevated ALPs? So the study was designed, in order to be in the study, you had to have an alkaline phosphatase 1.67 times the upper limit of normal, which is about 200. And you had to have a bilirubin below 2, I want to say. Um, and that was the... In, in, so that was what was required to get in the study. However, the FDA, uh, oh, and, and I should also say, you couldn't have severe pruritus, uh, and you couldn't have advanced liver disease, right? So the FDA labeling leaves it to the discretion of the physician and the patient to decide what an inadequate response to Urso is. So the FDA says, it's indicated for patients with PBC and an inadequate response to Urso. So I have patients that I'm trying to get it for um, who don't meet the entry criteria for the study, but they have advanced liver disease. And, and, um, or they're too advanced. The other ones are, are too advanced and wouldn't uh, be eligible for enrolling in, in certain other clinical trials. So um, yes, in the right setting, it would still be indicated. Now, would I put someone on it that had just a slightly ele elevated alkaline phosphatase um, that was stage one? Probably not. Um, I would probably monitor that person. We now have non-invasive ways of staging um, the liver, something called fiber scan, um, which will tell us when someone's progressed to the point where we might want to consider something like obeticolic acid. Um, but at this point, I think if it's just a mild elevation above normal in your early stage, I'd hold off. Okay. Yeah, so um, I haven't done a liver biopsy on a PVC patient outside of a study for a long time. Um, unless it's an AMA negative patient that we're biopsying to, to make a diagnosis. But most of the patients I see, they come in, they have an alkaline phosphatase that's elevated, we get an AMA, um, it's um, pos positive, and we'll, you know, if they don't have, 
you know, advanced disease just based on exam and, and non-invasive measures, then we'll get a fiber scan. In fact, right now we're doing a study where we're following uh, about 50 PBC patients over two years, and as part of that, we're doing fiber scans and what's called MR elastography, which is another, a little more sophisticated way of measuring the fibrosis in the liver. Um, and uh, they seem to work both very well. So uh, fiber scan is becoming more and more available. I would recommend that it be used rather than a liver biopsy. It is very good at telling whether you have cirrhosis or advanced fibrosis or not. It's not so good at telling whether you got stage one or two, um, but if you want to differentiate early versus late stage, it's pretty good and reasonably accurate. All right, last question. Indication of decompensated cirrhosis and there is a hepatitis um, hepatitis cirrhosis. How does that indicate advanced stage of cirrhosis? So when we talk about decompensated cirrhosis, um, that usually implies that there is a complication um, of the cirrhosis, ascites, varices, variceal bleeding, hepatic encephalopathy. Those are the main complications. So if you have cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy, then you have decompensated cirrhosis. And what was it? So yes. <laughs> <That? laughs> We would like to present you with this token of our appreciation for coming and speaking with us and taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.